Hello and most welcome to 1368. We will now take up the article we began with in lecture 1359 and covered a bit later on, partially in 1360. It's the chapter Malo's Analysis of perception and attention, and it's on page four of the paper. There will be a link in the description for you to follow the nice article by Anya Daly. And we are, for your convenience, I'm telling you that we are trying out a new audio. Any comments are most welcome are both the quality of the sound and of the video. They are both new. This marvelous device is supposed to be a noise canceller as well as not having to use a cord. This nasty cord will no longer bother me works. So help me God. We are at the second paragraph, third paragraph, entry chapter, subchapter, Merleau-Ponty's analysis of perception and attention. The notion of attentiveness plays a key role in the ethics of care literature, with noddings referring to receptive attention as a fundamental characteristic of caring, and Tronto proposing that attentiveness is first phase care. However, a phenomenological analysis of the role of perceptual attention in care and in morality is underexplored. Perception inherently depends on the body and vice versa. And percipient bodies are situated in the phenomenological realm as well as the intersubjective realm. Melo Ponty emphasized that there are no isolated sense data. These are unfindable in experience. Objects always exists within a field, whether a visual field, an auditory field, a tactile field, etc. So there are no disembodied solitary, wordless subjects, subjects as percipient bodies, exist within both 
the phenomenal field and the intersubjective field, including the shared world. As a quote from the author herself, Melo-Ponty grounds morality univocally in perception. Perception opens up the infinity of perceptual perspectives of all potential and historical others so that we inhabit a multiplicity of perspectives. Nonetheless, the view from everyone does not elide differences. While I am always on this side of my body, both physically and culturally, I am no longer the impenetrable interiority as advanced in Cartesianism. There are exchanges and intertwinings between subjects and the world. This is how Meloponti is able to universalize his ethics and thereby avoid reduction to a relativist monocular perspective. Moral consideration is thus never purely internal and private deliberation, but already implicates a multiplicity of perspectives. Excuse me. Importantly, Meloponti argues for a normativity within perception itself in contrast to traditional 
ethical theories which conceive normativity as supervening on the event, action and person according to the particular moral principle invoked. Virtue, utility or duty. Rather, every percept has the structure of a gestalt. It is holistic and functions according to the structures of figure. Ground, the ground prescribing how the phenomena and other subjects are perceived. In phenomenal realm, the ground environment prescribes how the figure object is perceived. For example, a misty atmosphere prescribes whether the landscape is perceived more or less determinatively. In the intersubjective realm, the context of others, the socio-political environment, and the culture prescribe more or less determinatively how the individual's self-perception, other perception and behavior are grounded. It is through the shifting attention between the figure and ground, between the object and environment, between the self and other, between the self and socio-political environment, that the specific form and conditioning power of normativity can be recognized. How can we better understand the role of attention in perception? Melo-Ponty 
is able to offer crucial insights. And these insights give further support to the establishment of his non-dual relational ontology. He begins firstly with critical analysis of the two predominant accounts of attention in the history of philosophy. Empiricism and rationalism exposing the limitation of these attention as searchlight accounts before setting out his own. The initial aims of Melo-Ponty's analysis of attention are thus directed at refuting empiricism and intellectualism, rationalism, and their accounts of objectivity. Melo Ponty writes Empiricism deduces the concept of attention from the constancy hypothesis, that is, the priority of the objective world. And attention is a spotlight illuminating pre-existing objects hidden in the shadows. The attention described in this account is disinterested, neutral to its objects, and so is difficult to account for consciousness, that there can be a connection between object and subject. And relatedly, how can a particular object be chosen among the multitudinous objects on offer? It would as Malo-Ponty describes, be necessary to show the power of perception 
to awaken attention. And then how attention develops and enriches this perception. On his account, empiricism thus has no resources to tackle these issues. Because it relies solely on external connections. My Lord Ponty then begins his consideration of the opposing accounts of intellectualism. Drawing on Descartes' example of the piece of wax, wax which reveals that consciousness either grasps its object with clarity or with degrees of confusion. The form, for example, of either the candle shape of the wax or of a geometric circle of a plate exists only because consciousness already put it there. He sums up his rejection of both accounts thus. What was lacking for empiricism? Was an internal connection between the object and the act it triggers. What intellectualism lacks is the contingency of the opportunities for thought. Consciousness is too poor in the first case and too rich in the second for any phenomenon to be able to solicit it. Empiricism does not see that we need to know what we are looking for. Otherwise, we would not go looking for it. Intellectualism does not see that we need to be ignorant of what we are looking for, or again, we would not go looking for it.
The upshot is that both empiricism and rationalism presuppose a pre-existing objective world for which attention provides mutual access. Either directly through sensations or indirectly through representations. Jag sitter något annorlunda på. Ja. Either directly through sensations or indirectly through representations. However, Melopontu proposes that attention transforms the attention, the experience, and is a new way for consciousness to be present toward its object. and does this by creating a perceptual field according to the specificities of the exploratory perceptual organ. If the object includes features such as color, light and form, then the field created depends on visual exploration. If it includes features of sound, tone, rhythm, then the field created depends on auditory exploration. Until attention is directed towards the object within a sensory or thematic field. Both the object and the field remain indeterminate. The subject is unable to identify, to understand, or to make sense of the perceived object until attention is solicited. And the field, even if not the focus of attention, is still an active presence within the perceptual encounter. The perceptual syntax includes attention, which brings the constellations of givens. Together gives them sense 
and moreover guarantees that they can have sense. Attention is thus neither neutral nor, nor indifferent to its objects. Attention transforms the experience of the object. Or, presence with objects and presence with other subjects. In this section, I draw together a few ideas from diverse perspectives to make sense of the idea of attentive presence and to demonstrate its importance in ethical encounter. Within the literature on care ethics, there are various approaches to what is generally referred to as attentiveness and the diversity of definitions and the diversity of domains of application of attentiveness betray a certain level of conceptual imprecision. Sometimes the term attentiveness is used as an equivalent to attention An article titled Attentiveness in Care Towards a Theoretical Framework seeks to offer clarification on attentiveness, particularly in healthcare setting, and it delineates a number of useful distinctions. However, from a phenomenological perspective, a few imprecisions persists. The authors state in the abstract that they will argue that attentiveness is constitutive for good care as it can create a space in which relationship may arise. While it is indisputable that attentiveness is essential for good care, that it allows for the space for a quality of care 
that is deemed good. Nonetheless, the relationship is primary. It pre-exists the attentiveness. The relation is non-negotiable, however, attentiveness is not guaranteed. There is a similar confusion in the analysis of noddings when she writes We listen or observe receptively and then we feel empathy. That is, attention precedes empathy. In my view, observing receptively is in fact a manifestation of empathy. Noddings refers to a chain of events in caring, a causal chain. This, in my view, is not correct. The understanding of attention is imprecise due to the failure to take account of the ontological and, so I turn now to phenomenology and cognitive science, which offer insightful analysis addressing this issue. Attention for Merleau-Ponty is transformative in that it gives the subject a new way of being present to objects. However, in the intersubjective domain, I am proposing that attentive presence is triply transformative, giving simultaneously a new way to be present to the subject's sense of self, to the sense of other subjects, and to the other's subject's sense of self. attentiveness or caring attention. Therefore, transforms the self-experience of the carer. The experience of the other and the self-experience of the recipient of the care simultaneously. Reciprocal attentiveness thus allows for mutuality 
in understanding each other's affectivity, situatedness, and historicity. This supports a calibrated responsivity that is suitably attuned to the experiential specificit specificities of the other. and guards against dominating stances which would overtly uh, and covertly bend the interactions to the agenda of the carer. Presence is not the outcome of attention, nor attention the outcome of presence. They are co-arising. And attempting presence is transformative. Concisely, we can say that intersubjective attentive presence is a reversible relation and this is why it serves to both underwrite and illuminate the authenticity of the ethical encounter. Interestingly, Bart picks up on the idea of presence as being significant for care. He presents the idea that presence is something that is cultivated through attuning to another's Tempo, goals, work rhythm, language, work style, interests, perspective, etc. The practitioner of presence offers, in addition to professional knowledge and experience, him or herself. I will try to make a summary here and I thought firstly it was very keen that attention transforms the experience and both empiricism and rationalism they do presuppose what I would call uh, left hemisphere idea of attention. Which is neutral as daily call it. I would call it passive also. This is the idea that we are detached from experience. And I think the idea that we are sitting in the theater looking at the scenery, the act it's over here. Here, all the action, you can call it cause and effect, you can call it the object or objects, properties. James Locke would have it this way. And he would say that there is a first principle situated here on the stage. 
and there is something happening within the passive perceptual sphere of the theater on Luca, passively theater on Luca. And I would say that this tendency becomes even stronger in Immanuel Kant. In Kant, both these tendencies are directly caused by something else. We have no influence over neither the outer world nor the inner world. I think he called that das Ding an sich the thing as it is it's a pure direct indisputable fact and i think this reformulation of daily here makes e makes it even clearer and the formulation from melo pontu of course pinpointing to the attractiveness but also that think about it could it be a specific attention? Because neither James Locke nor Kant or anybody else of the idealist or the empiricist would call it a type of attention. They never see it as an attention. It's just there. There it goes. Das Ding an sich. It is the directedness itself. Maybe that thinking inside of your inner sphere will condition you to be in that way. And that conditioning is in society, in all these different strands of attention, that this understanding do not, do not really allow for. It is not really there to be understood. Maybe it's an image as Ludwig Wittgenstein would have it that somewhere in our lifetime, when you grow up or when civilization matures, has sort of captured us and we become hypnotized. We're sitting in the theater and we get pretty comfy there and we get this forgetfulness. We forget that we could leave the theater and have another attention. Melo Ponty and Daly is pointing to those exit, exits, I have to say, in the theater, where you can just put your ticket in the waste basket and say, I'm leaving. I'll have it. another attention. Another person that brings to mind here, comes to mind, is Susie Froebel, where the fractality of the organism is always, by default, different. So our attention is already always different. It is, in her explanation, that difference that makes it possible to have the experience. And I would say Froebel pushes it one step more in the direction of different attention. Then you realize, hmm, even if I am captivated by this image, as Wittgenstein would call it, it is never the case, not even for me, me sitting here, I will go through different attentions and it could also be the case that I leave the theater and just in my mind, I am imagining 
myself to still sit there. And I can imagine together with this attention com comes a different corporal posture. How it looks, I cannot depict. I have no idea. The very end point of it, which people seldom show, is what we in Swedish call a fogelholk. It's that open mouth attention where you just gawk at something and you cannot move. You are for an instant paralyzed what the scenery presents. Maybe in that millisecond you are very close to your idealized way of seeing the world. The perfect position sitting in the theater chair just passively and of course neutrally taking in and being objective and being able to go into that exclusive club where people who have objective truths are situated. A club that you want to enter. A club that has as members advantages and unlimited access to truth for only two months and the monthly fee is awful, awfully low. You can access the truth passively by doing nothing. Melo Ponty and Daily is hinting to something greater. Not only being a spectator of the theater, but as I imagine once upon a time, that the spectators were actually in the scenery, going into the scenery, committing, changing the course of the scenery, and thereby enjoying much more and having a greater portion of reality once you sort of, well, snap out of this, <gasps> ah, well, I am here. There's a special attention here in this room. There is a special ambience. And by accessing it, all the other objects of my desire become even clearer, deeper, or as Froebel would have it, more complex and knowledgeable, more informative. And then you can pick whatever you want. I think good actors and directors, scripts, scripters, Everyone working in the theatre wants to have active theatre goers. Of course, they don't have to shout. But as an actor, I can imagine having someone actively looking at you, taking in what you are presenting. It's a lot more rewarding. More rewarding for the actor and the spectator. And that is caring. That's true caring. And this is a false caring. And in the end, you think you're not egoistical because you're not participating. I'm a good person. I'm not even in the act. I sacrifice my, myself here. But that's not true, according to Daly. The point is, once you let yourself into the act, True caring can come. And that is heartful and heartfelt. I think there is a positive comment here. See if we can see if we can move this microphone. It should be upwards. Thank you. Hello, hello. How do you put it here? Like this. Does it look good? Hello, hello. So I would like to 
quote Niels Bohr, the Danish physicist, who said, we are both spectators and actors in the great drama of life. And we have this quotation in Wene Heisenberg's book, Physics and Beyond. So I repeat, we are spectators and actors in the great drama of life. And so we can compare it uh, with this idea. So, um, but I think that we can easily misunderstand uh, this quotation. So we, it's easy that we think this uh, kind of dualism, that is, uh, we are on the scene, theater scene, and we can imagine ourselves uh, actors on the scene or as spectators. But more, he wasn't a dualist. What we can see from his coat of arms uh, that states contraria sunt complementa. Contrary things are complementary. So spectators and actors are not uh, in opposition to each other. They complement each other. And I would also like to um, uh, refer to a great book by Jacques Derrida, Spectres of Marx. Spectres of Marx. He uh, did this point for something else, but I would like to think about the word spectres. It has the same etymology as spectator. Mm -hmm. Spectare. Uh, let me double check. I wrote it down. Spectar, yes, it means watch. And so spectres and spectator has the same etymology. So today I would claim that our view of the spectator, the common view of spectator, is something that is a passive, almost a spectre, a spectre like a ghost. So the modern spectator is like a ghost who, in front of the, I don't know, video, television, only watches without care to use uh, a word from Dali's article. Yes, indeed, like uh, watching in a mobile phone like that. But the true spectator, in uh, Dali's, uh, Anya Dali's sense, and also in the sense of Melopontu is to care that is you are involved. If you, let's see, take an example, you watch a movie, uh, somebody dies and you feel care. Mm. So you, uh, you are a participant. Yes. Yes. Indeed, um, we might think that we don't, we are passing in one way, uh, but I think it's a wrong way of uh, doing it's, it's not in that way that more thought about we are spectators and actors. We should both think in an active sense, actors and uh, passive, but because we always care, we create the reality. Uh, so we are spectators and actors in the great drama of life, as more said. Otherwise, if you think uh, um, that we are not active, that we are only watching without possibly influencing it, we are actually as spectators. The, if we think like that, we reason like that, the fault lies in us. Oh, yeah. mm. It's like uh, to use, uh, ref, uh, to, 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 to uh, quote, Matil Christ, that is left side uh, of the brain thinking. So the fault lies in us, if we think that we cannot uh, um, participate in the thinking. So attention is needed. So I leave uh, it back to you, Hans, please. Yes, uh, to put the point extra clear, earlier in the article, she proposed a discussion between a proponent, I thought that was one of her colleagues, and she said caring could be give everything to every, someone without thinking about oneself like a 100% altruistic sense. I think Daly saw this as more of a spectator sort of caring. And she was pointing to, uh, in her view, that that is not the care she and Melo Pontu is looking for. It's a care that always already take care of yourself as well, because it's a cooperative thing. It's not just one person. 
you do it together, uh, it's a complementary to go back to Boris, so aptly put by Kali here, it's complementary. You do it at the same time, you do it communally, and both the distinctions between spectator and actor becomes clear, but also the oneness at the very same time. There's a bit of Heraclitus here. The more opposition you have, the more unity, but you can still keep the difference or even get more difference. I say thank you very much and have a very pleasant afternoon. Bye-bye.